hello. Welcome to Gareth Jones on Speed. I'm Gareth, and no one else for company except the car that I'm driving. I apologise that we missed the last show, and I promised that we'd make up for it. So what we're going to do is knock out a couple of quick-fire shows to make up for the slight gap between the last programme and this one. I've been driving a car for the last week or so now. It's a Lexus, but the littlest of the Lexus, and you're in that car with me now, because I'm on my way to an airport in this car, not Heathrow, another one, Farnborough, but more on that in the next show. But for the last 10 days, I've been driving this car around Britain. The first thing I did, of course, was take it up to North Wales, and the car is the Lexus IS, that is the smallest of the Lexus, if you don't count the CT200, which isn't out yet, but it's the Lexus IS F. It's about the size of a 3 Series, you know all this, I'm sure, but it's got a V8 engine, which sounds like this. I can't really hear it there, it's a bit muted. That's because I'm holding a recording device in one hand, and I have to find a place to put it down so I can do that. Hang on. You might just get it taste for the engine here. Um, I'll open the window a bit. Yep, makes a good noise and then it says 40 miles per hour so you have to slow down. So like any car that you drive these days you just have to drive to the speed limits and the speed restrictions and the massive traffic but when it is possible to put your foot down you don't have to put your foot down very far with this car before it reaches something approaching orbital velocity. Now, I don't know the actual figures. It's got in excess of 400 mega plato centi neutron thumpers for power. And it'll do a top speed of, they say, 168 miles per hour. I can't verify that, obviously. Uh, but I can verify the fact that it does want to get there as soon as it possibly can. It tends to uh, go quick, this car, if you ask it. I think the 0-62 miles per hour acceleration time is... 4.8 seconds, which makes it quicker than that Lotus Evora that I was driving recently. So this is a very, very seriously quick car designed to take on the M3s and AMG Mercedes, I suppose. What does the F stand for? ISF. Flipping quick. Flipping quick. When the car was dropped off to me, the chap who dropped it said, oh, I wouldn't turn the traction control off. It might be a bit of a handful. I took his advice, and in fact, when I was up in North Wales last week, there's a hill on the A55 going east. It's called the Riast Hill. It's a beautiful hill which opens out from the Vale of Cluid and goes up to a hill over the tops of Hollywell, my hometown. So this is a three-lane dual carriageway, you know, a crawler lane and two other lanes. And as we were going up the hill, a bunch of traffic peeled off from doing 60 miles per hour into the left-hand lane to allow, a, you know, once a truck had moved over, they all moved over, clearing the outside lane, and I put my foot down in this thing, and the back end, doing it 60 miles per hour, did a little skippity hop. I kept it all under control, but just enough to tell you, I can do very serious things. I am a very powerful car. <laughs> it's great fun. It's a... Um, very well balanced car. It's got a front end which is as solid, I nearly said uh, as solid as a pension then, but that was probably the wrong thing to say. A front end that's as solid as property. And a back end which is as stiff as me after a, a week's walking in Cornwall, I suppose. The back end is a bit stiff. It truly is. I was experiencing this extraordinary thing as I was driving through Islington earlier tonight. I'm sure you've heard me mention this before. Islington is probably the town with the greatest number of speed bumps. I know. And I have to drive through Islington if I'm going practically anywhere from home. So this little fella goes through the speed bumps of Islington at 20 miles per hour like he should. The front end thump bumps up and the back end, being so stiff and so eager to go, literally springs off the speed bump, pitching forward like a little March hare, kicking out its back legs. It's uh, an extraordinary little hoppity skip. 
So you've got an idea what's going on here. It's a car that can accommodate four people, not five. Four people. There is no middle seat in the rear. The armrest folds up, but there's no seat belt and you can't put someone there. When I discovered when I got to North Wales and I believed I was going to be taking five people somewhere, I couldn't get them in, so I did a swap. I traded this glorious car for an old Range Rover, the Range Rover that had the 2.5 litre diesel turbo engine. I think it was the Italian engine, the VM. And frankly, going from this to that car was astonishing. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, it's amazing what, what you get used to. It sort of resets your expectations. But to have my expectations reset from this car, which is profoundly quick, to a profoundly slow Range Rover was a wonderful entertainment. Having driven that discovery with the 4-litre turbocharged uh, engine at the moment, it was a heck of a difference to what Range Rover diesel drivers had to be used to. Needless to say, glad to be back in the ISF, which did stalwart work taking Violet and our children and I up to North Wales and back. It really was wonderful on the Mole Denby Road, a road which I've driven on for many, many years. There aren't many overtaking opportunities, and when they are, they're brief. But in this car, that's just not a problem. It's sort of press a button and be the other side of Wales. That's what that right-hand pedal does. Press this and you're the other side of Wales, or the other side of the country, wherever you are. Talking about pedals on this car... It's got a third pedal. Curiously, and I think this is a giveaway that it's meant for the American market, uh, it has no handbrake release. It has a handbrake release that's a foot pedal, like an American rental car, which is cool, actually. An automatic car with eight speeds that this ISS has. You don't need to be worrying about changing gear. It does it itself all the time, rather nicely, actually. And, of course, there's the obligatory sport mode, or as I prefer to call it in this car, OH MY GOD! mode, because this car is alive, but if you go for the manual option and select sport mode, it's more than alive. It's a bit like those people that you used to meet at raves in the 90s, who probably hadn't slept for a week and wouldn't need to for another week. Really going some. It really is. Amazing. One or two criticisms of a car, really small, I'm sure, but it does have a nice USB socket, which you can plug your USB pen drive into, but my uh, little card reader wouldn't work with it, and it wouldn't read my SD card on my sat now when I plug that into it, and it should see it as a drive, but it doesn't, so it's a bit finicky over what you can put in there, and the USB stick seems to be favourite. The last car I had with plug-in media was the Audi A8, which had four SD card slots. Four. Now, that's a smart idea. That it truly is. Hang on, we can go a bit here. Not too much, though, but we are clear of traffic as we approach Farnborough. The SD card gets my vote, I think, over the USB stick, but I'm very glad it's got a USB stick. It talks Bluetooth to my phone very, very nicely. Actually, is it as good as the Audi coming to think of it? No, not quite as good as the Audi A8, but very good. It's a Mark Levinson stereo, which is fabo, but just lacks a little bit. The Mark Levinson stereo that was in the, uh, let me think, LS600H, was it, I had, was phenomenal. I gave it the Björk Hyperballad test, and that rattles your lower frequencies. I haven't done that test on this car, but I will before it goes back. But really, you know, this isn't a car to listen to music in. This is a proper car to drive, and there are those who reckon that the ISF is better than the M3. Well, that would make this an amazing car. I mean, it is an amazing car. I don't know how good the M3 is. I haven't driven one. So that's something I'm going to have to reserve my judgment on. It is a bit of a thumpity bump ride. But that's to be expected. It's not too bad. It's just the back end throws people off the seats a little bit. Although I did carry a man in the car in North Wales. And he said that the back seat wasn't a problem. No, no, no. Ride's lovely. 
But there again, this is a man who is so light. I rather suspect that between the time him getting in the car and us getting out of the car, he was so light, he was still floating down to the seat like a feather and hadn't actually touched it. Because it is thumpy bum. Uh, my kids thought the car was all right. Yeah, they didn't love it because it was a bit uncompromising for them. But they did like it when we were able to go around roundabouts very plantedly. Is that a word? Plantedly? In terms of fuel economy, it's done really well at the moment. The tank average is, say, 23.1 miles per gallon. That's a quick blast up to North Wales and around the lanes of North Wales and then up to Lancashire. And it was fantastic on the M6 when there was no traffic. And then back down to London and, and then cross London in the most awful of traffic. Truly horrible. But the car is a baby to drive in the city. It really isn't a problem at all. I really do like this car. Is it as good as the Jaguar XFR that I drove last year? I'd like to compare the figures. It certainly feels a little quicker in terms of acceleration. It doesn't feel as live or as compliant as the Jaguar. It's very planted in a kind of Volkswagen Golf kind of way. The Jaguar was more of an Alfa Romeo kind of something very alive about the car. This is rock solid, steadfast, and at very high speed when allowed. This car is exceptionally good. That's why you have to compromise the ride at lower speeds to make it functional at high speed. There really isn't very much space between the tread on the tyre and the wheel arch, so no wonder this car does bump around a little bit over lumps and bumps. You can probably hear them now, actually. They're just grids, because there's nowhere for the suspension to go. So in a perfect world, this car would accommodate those bumps in the way that the Jaguar XFR did. Okay, onto a roundabout. The interior of the ISF is a lovely place to be steering wheel about the right size not too small the seats nice cream almost white leather proper sport seats which you do need in a car of this kind of lateral performance otherwise you'd be sitting in the passenger seat when you're supposed to be the driver when you go round roundabouts so the seats are dead right they've got that right and they're also heated independently the look inside is really nice it's got this kind of brushed aluminium underneath plastic resin centre console which is kind of nice it looks like the sort of braided pickups that you used to have underneath the nose of scale electric cars when you were a kid but instead of being brass they're sort of silver coloured really nice little bit of plastic in here that perhaps shouldn't be in here something a little bit hard and I think Lexus would do well to eradicate that completely it isn't present in any of their other cars only the IS as far as I've noticed I like the way when you wake this car up simply by putting your foot on the brake and pressing the start button with the electronic key in your pocket no nonsense putting the key in a slot which you just don't need anywhere just keep it on your person press the start button and as it blips the engine to come alive, the needles on the speedo and rev counter do a little dance from 0 to 180 miles per hour in the case of the speedo and uh, the 9,000 revs in the case of the rev meter. And at the same time, the steering wheel reaches out from a slightly tucked away position that it had found itself when you turn the engine off. So it makes room for you to get in and out of the car as if that were a problem. It truly isn't. It's only a smallish car compared to some of the big behemoths I've driven recently, like the Audi A8 or the Land Rover Discovery. But this car does not feel cramped at all. You sit low. You really do. You sit low like a proper sports car. I like that idea of being down there with the action. That's where you should be, in my opinion. Yeah, the Lexus ISF's all right. I struggled a little bit with the sat nav. It only allows you to put postcodes in to like the first three digits. So if it was, uh, let's say, LG47QN, then it would only allow you to put the LG47Q bit in. Well, won't let you put the last bit in, which is a shame, because that would take you bang to the door. So it does require that you use your brain a little bit. There are loads and loads of buttons on the dash. 
it's got cruise control with a distance meter that will keep you a fixed distance from the car in front which works really well although will cut out rather than stop the car prevent you from hitting the thing in front which as I remember the bigger Lexus had that option and I like that I did I like that but now the traffic's opened up a bit so I'm just going for a little pop here we go the only Lexus I know that doesn't do what all of the Lexus do and that is waft you serenely it's as though they're fed up doing that Lexus and they want to have a go at being you know a BMW sporting brand and they're very capable of doing it but I would be more impressed with this car if they managed to do that and add Lexus wafting ability at the same time. Jaguar would do that with a very supple chassis. I'm sure Lexus guys can do it, but they just haven't yet. Oh, roundabout, here we go. Nice. Well, you can steer it with the back end. I was being very careful there, even with the traction control on. This thing is lively. I was talking to Violet about this car the other day. Do you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the XR3. And I don't mean that as an insult. The Ford Escort XR3, when it came out, was wonderful. It was a refreshing, exciting, stimulating, rewarding car to drive. And so is this. It makes you giggle at just how much power it's got. And I know it's a four times the power of the XR3 when it came out. I must think about what those figures could be and twice the lateral grip. But even so, it makes me as happy as that car did. It is a bit more like a fast Ford than a Lexus because it doesn't do that wafty thing. I do like it, can you tell? So apart from the LFA, the Lexus supercar, could this ISF be the last non-hybrid Lexus ever? I hope not because it's fantastic. Right, I have to concentrate now because I'm approaching the hotel that I am staying in tonight and then I'm flying into Rome tomorrow to drive a couple more very, very interesting Japanese cars. They're not a Lexus, they're someone else. But that's in the next episode of Gareth Jones on Speed. I was Gareth Jones. See you for the next show. To send us an email, see pictures, get song lyrics, join our Facebook fan site or follow us on Twitter, go to garethjones.tv. Gareth Jones on Speed is made in London by Whizbang. Gareth Jones on Speed!